Two external gears can mesh rotate in opposite directions. If you've got them the same size, you rotate, you can drive one one way. If it's hooked up, you can't go the other way. The starter on every car that I've ever known about turns in the opposite direction from the flywheel. And you can count the gears. If you've got, you may see a test, something on test one day that shows you a whole bunch of gears. And they'll say, if this bottom gear is turning clockwise, how will, which way will the top gear be turning? And you count them, and if it's an odd number, they'll be turning the same way. If it's an even number, they'll be turning the opposite way, the one with the gear on the other end. That's the thing. And I shorten this a little bit because an engine driving a gear clockwise will cause any gear to mesh with it and rotate counterclockwise. So what you do, you get the driven gear to turn clockwise, the third gear has got to be added. So if you want them both to go the same way, you've got to put a third gear in here. This is going to take us into the realm of manual transmissions. And there is some good stuff on your uh, elective stuff about clutches. So pay attention to your clutch stuff. I'm not going to do a lot of clutch stuff right now. Uh, okay, you got a lot of different gears. You have spur gears, helical gears, and spur bevel gears. Okay, give me an example of a spur gear. Is that more than one that make up a spider gear? Or the spider? Well, you're close. This is actually the spider gears, a little transaxle, a spur bevel gears. See the spur bevel gears in there? You've seen this before, right? Anybody that's ever seen a differential looking apart has seen spur bevel gears. That's what those are. Okay, helical cut gears are the gears that don't have straight teeth. They're sort of curved, and I'll show you some of those later because i got a transmission over here I'm going to set up, and we're going to show you how all the gears, the power flow through it. And that's one of the things that's going to be at least a part of your manual transmission. Finally, show me power flow through the transmission. And uh, what gets me is how people freeze up whenever I'm sitting here and it's the final exam and they've got to do that. Okay, spur gears are actually the ones, every transmission just about has got spur gears for reverse. Have you ever noticed when you're driving a manual transmission, when you go to put it in reverse, sometimes it won't go unless you let off the clutch and mash it again and move the gears a little bit? That's because there's not a synchronizer for reverse. Got me? All right. There's your spur gear. Spur gear is the simplest design. It's kind of noisy, not quite as strong. Main advantage is teeth are cut straight so it can slide in and out of contact with other gears, and that's how you put one in reverse. Its main disadvantage is it's noisy. The spur gear winds at high speed. If a spur gear is found in a manual transmission or transaxle, it's usually only used for reverse gear. You ever back up heard of one? All right. Here's your helical gears. You've seen these gears that are cut this way. They're a little stronger, they're quieter, they don't have lash, typically. Helical gears are the most common types of gears in manual transmission. Now, my, you can look at helical cut gears and they may look just fine, but that doesn't mean they won't be noisy. Gears can look good and sound bad. When my dad ran a shop for 30 something years and somebody would bring a transmission to him in the back of a pickup truck and they say, this transmission is making noise, can you fix it? And he says, no. And they said, what are you talking about? No. He says, you put it in the car, bring it back up here, and let me drive it, and then let me pull it out, and I'll fix it. But I'm not going to fix it, because whenever you tear it apart, you probably won't see anything if the gears are what's noisy. See what I'm saying? The gears, you can see something in some cases, but gears can be noisy and whining and carrying on, either in a rear end or in a manual transmission, and you may not even see why. They may be polished. They may, may be pretty. Mismatch. It's worse in rear ends than it is transmission, but in transmission sometimes we'll have noisy gears when there's no bad bearings or anything. Now think about this. I've got one that's uh, a linear transmission, you know, engines in the front, got a drive shaft in the rear end, and it's really quiet in all the gears except, I mean, it's really noisy in all the gears except fourth. That's more common than you would ever knew. It's really quiet in fourth gear, but it's noisy in every other gear. What's wrong? As soon as you drive it, you know. I was working at the Mazda place a long time ago, back in the early 80s, and I pulled the transmission out of an RX-7 that had that same kind of a problem. I knew exactly what was wrong with it. But I didn't like handling all those greasy gears and all this kind of stuff, so I took the thing over to the steam cleaner, and I stood it up with the cover off of the back of it and all that kind of stuff, and I got the steam cleaner good and hot, and I just stuck it down in there and let it boil. And it pushed all that oil out of there. And when all the oil pushed out, all that, you know, the thing was really, hot, really, really hot boiling, and all the steam went out of there, and the oil was gone and all. And I put it up on the bench, and I opened it up, and it was like working on brand new parts. Well, I had to put an input shaft bearing in it because that's what was wrong with it. And as you understand power flow on a, tra on a manual transmission, you'll understand why that input shaft bearing 
is the only one that's not loaded when it's in fourth, and you'll understand why. We'll go to that. Uh, this gonna let you gotta have these gears though are kind of an angle, so the gears act to the gears axis rotation, so there's two or more teeth be in full contact at all times. Here you go. This Greek engineer Archimedes once said, give me a lever long enough and a place to put it, and I can lift the world. That's what this is all about. See how these gears are laid out here? Transmission stuff is all like that. The transmission, this is manual transmission too, by the way. Now, there are manual transmissions nowadays that are automatically shifted. You heard anything about that? BMW trucks and stuff like that. Yeah, and some of the big trucks have got them. Some of these big um, Eaton transmissions that Eddie teaches down there. He has people come to talk, and they've actually, you know, they automatically shift so you don't, and they, you know, the truck driver that knows what he's doing, you know, will watch the tachometer and he'll, you know, they don't have synchronizers and knows he's got to get the engine the right speed so he synchronizes the gears using the speeds listed, you know, watching attack and all this. I get to where they're really good at that. But the Eaton trans the newest Eaton transmission, you just tell it you want to go and it shifts gears automatically. They've got a little Ford car or some of them. They've got those transmissions. They've got two input shafts, two clutches, and they got a bunch of uh, solenoid stuff in there that operates the gear, the shift forks and all that. And that's kind of the way they're wanting to go with a lot of that kind of stuff because it's not nearly as complicated as an automatic transmission, but it looked just like a manual transmission on the inside. A set of levers arranged in a circle. That's what gears are. They multiply force by the difference in size and the number of teeth in the gear. Well, you got you got a 300 foot pound torque engine that's moving a 3,000 pound car. 300 foot pounds of torque is not enough to move a 3,000 pound car without gears. So it's basically, how do you get the gear ratio of the drive line? You're going to multiply all the way back. You're going to multiply the gear ratio of the transmission by the gear ratio of the rear end, and you're going to get the whole gear ratio of the drive line. Uh, what, is, what kind of gear ratio is first gear usually? One to four to what? Four to one. Four turns of the engine and one turn of the drive shaft. You know that. You're revving up. How many of you ever, have ever drove a 10-speed bicycle? All right, whenever you're driving around a 10-speed bicycle and you're in low gear, what are your feet doing? And you're going really slow. Now you can pull a long hill without a whole lot of energy that way. But when you shift to the next gear, the higher you go, I mean, those gears, the faster you go and the more energy you've got to put out to go up hills. Even on a car, it's like that. You know, you sometimes go down shift going up hill. Uh, transmission gear ratio is a term that describes the difference in the number of teeth of gears and mesh. Gears that are the same size are in a one to one ratio. Two gears are both the same size and have the same number of teeth, right? Each time the driving gear on the left makes a complete rotation, the driving gear on the right does. You turn it at the same speed, they're the same size, have the same number of teeth, we're beating a dead horse. Everybody gets this. The only difference between them is they're rotating in opposite direction, but this is still one to one. The smaller gear on the left has 16 teeth, and it's driving the larger gear on the right. The 16 tooth driving gear is turning with 10 pounds of torque, but it rotates twice for every rotation of the 32 teeth gear. You can see how you got more power here, right? Got it? You ever seen these people take these lawnmowers and change the gears on them so they'll go 50 or 60 miles an hour and race lawnmowers? That's pretty darn dangerous, but it's, it, it looks funny as all get out to see them going 50, 60 miles an hour on a lawnmower going two worlds around the curve, you know? Well, they wear helmets. The driven gear <coughs> is going to have twice as much torque in every rotation. You multiply your torque that way. Turns with 20 pounds of torque, that's a gear ratio of 2 to 1. So, engine with a 3,000 pound, move a 300 pounds of torque, move a 3,000 pound vehicle. The drivetrain's got to have a gear ratio of 10 to 1. You're multiplying all the way back, just like I said earlier. Uh, it's, got a, it's got a 10 to 1 gear ratio. The result is the 3,000 pounds of torque supplied at the wheels, which is the amount of power needed to move the 3,000 pound vehicle. You need torque if you're going to pull off from a stop. There's a drawback to reduction ratio gears. The driving gear must turn a lot faster than the driven gear, so the engine revs up. At 6,000 RPM, turns a drive train with a 10 to 1 gear ratio at only 600 RPM. That's not very fast. Okay, once it starts to move, it doesn't require much power. You know about that, you're shifting gears, going up and all that. I'm not going to go that. This is typical gear ratios found in manual transmissions. Look at the interesting thing here. Reverse is 3.4 to 1. First gear, 3.97 to 1. Second gear, 2.34 to 1. Third gear, 1.46 to 1. Fourth gear, 1 to 1. Okay. Take job. Oh, no. We threw those on the floor. Okay. Yeah, put those on. You don't have to lay down. Right. You'll probably have to, but just start by weighing that around real quick. 
you be really careful and don't come, don't sit around here with no breaks. Never no more. I need your two of these. And we got some more coming. Okay. All right. Hurry up. How long does it take? Huh? All right. Let's give me a break. Thank you. Okay. Now then, what we are reverses. See, that's the same thing right there. Reverse it first through third, or reduction ratio here. Fourth gear is one to one. That's what I was talking about earlier because in a fourth gear you're locked straight all the way through and there's no side play on that bearing or no side load on it. Uh, they all got the same number of teeth, they're rotating at the same speed, which is called a red drive. But I'm not going too fast for anybody. <coughs> all right. What you're going to get a chance to do when you go into your computer stuff is this will become crystal clear because it's actually going to tell you in very plain and you can go over it again and again. You know, this right here is a sort of a foundational thing. All right, any time the driving gear is rotating slower than the driven gear, it's an overdrive gear ratio. Engines turning slower than the drive shaft, that's overdrive. It gives you your gas mileage and everything, what I was talking about. So if you want to see if the total gear ratio of the entire drive train, like I said, multiply all the way back. You've got a 3.78 to 1 ratio. Determine the actual gear ratio being used in any specific gear. Multiply it by 3.78. See, your, your differential gears, what does it mean? Some of you race car fanatics. If I've got four 11 gears, what does that mean? I got four 11 gears in the rear end of my car. What does that mean? What do those numbers really mean? Anybody know? There's lots of noise going on there. Oh, she's just Kathy. She's noisy anyway. Um, what you got? 4.1 turns of the drive shaft to one turn of the wheels, which is a pretty low ratio. Your race car has got what? You know what they are? Gear ratio on the rear end? Uh, yeah, what about you? Yeah, I've got a bunch of race cars, so you don't know the gear ratio on all those, do you? Okay, all right, this here for, so first gear has got 3.97 to 1, multiply it by the differential ratio of 3.7 to 1, you're gonna find out you got a 15 to 1 ratio when you're in low gear. That's not, that's not complicated, is it? Now this is the manual transmission. So although the manual transmission is very straightforward, many different components are needed to make its operation practical. Now this is how this works. Three speed, manual transmission, first gear. This input shaft is coming from the engine. Hold out my laser here. Coming from the engine. It's turning this gear. This right here is the counter shaft. The counter shaft is turning any time the clutch is engaged and the engine's running. Okay? Because if this one's turning, that one's going to be turning. However, because of the way gears, and we're going to get in that a second, the way gears are set up, this one will not always be turning if it's in neutral. And this one can, will be turning at an entirely different speed than that one in every gear except the one to one. So this is driving this, and that's driving that, and that's driving that. See how those ratios work? You're basically working this gear ratio and that one, this gear ratio against that one, but everything is transmitted through that one because this being the same size as that. See that? Move manual transmission in the first gear requires four gears and three shafts. So you got one, two, three, and you got four gears. There's your power flow. Burn that in. That's important. Okay, the small gear on the input shaft drives a larger gear faster than the transmission counter shaft. Another small gear faster than the counter shaft drives a larger gear on the out input shaft. Now this one and this one are different sizes, but the difference between this one and this one are what makes the difference. See what I'm saying? In other words, excuse me, the difference between that one and that one because that one's the same size as this one. That's confusing, isn't it? Look at the size of the gears. You can see there's a gear reduction between the input shaft gear and the counter shaft gear. Reduction here, and it goes back up and out that way. Uh, so there's more gear reduction between the counter shaft first gear and the output shaft. See, basically you can look at that and figure out what's going on. You basically are going to be turning this one what? This is turning that one. If, if, you're, if you take this one here and put it down there, so you've added another one, so this is going to be turning the same direction because you've got another gear in between. <laughs> so, so that one right there is going to be a low gear, right? Because it's a little gear driving a bigger gear. Okay, three speed, second gear. All right, you see the difference in the size here? That one's going to here, and that's going to a larger one, which is basically going to a little bit smaller one. Now, these are spur gears, and they're not like the, what you would see in a helical cut transmission, but this is the way the power flows. All right, and we'll show you in a minute how we change all of this on the fly. All right, it's already moving, not as much torque required. That's not complicated. Look at this, third gear on a three-speed transmission, you got one-to-one. -one. B 
The gears are not even germane to the situation because you got a straight lock up all the way through, going right out to your drive shaft. Right? All right, it's electrical, excuse me, mechanically connected to the output shaft. Each rotation of the input shaft, there's your one to one. You can see how that works right there. Now, this is reverse gear. Now that's a kind of a confusing picture, but whenever you move another one, these two aren't enmeshed with each other until that one's in play. And what that does is it adds another gear, and if this one's turning this way, that one will be turning that way, and then this one will be turning the opposite direction from that one. You'll figure that out later. If we're going too fast for you, it's all in the book. Don't worry about it. All right. Got reverse gear. See, this is basically got some verbiage up there. I built this about 15 years ago. Uh, and that's what that looks like. The reverse power still enters the transmission through the input shaft going the same way. Transfer to the counter shaft gear. On a hybrid vehicle, the electric motors in the transmission are always giving you reverse. Electric motors can turn either forward or backward in a hybrid transmission, and you know, hybrid transaxle, but only the, the engine can only turn in one direction, but the, the other motors can, the electric ones can reverse. And so that's reverse. Let's not get into that too much. The counter shaft reverse gear is smaller than the reverse speed gear, and that's a reduction gear ratio to multiply power in reverse. Since reverse can only be engaged from a standing stop, you've got to have a little more torque to get it moving, right? In other words, you can't shift it in reverse going down the road. This is the time for a short war story. There was a guy that used to do commercials on television, and I think he's down in Florida somewhere now. And he got, had a little Bronco that the Ford place gave him for a uh, demo, brand new car, because he was doing advertising for the dealership. They gave him a demo, which is a car that he could drive for until he's got 6,000 miles on it. Then he's got to turn it in and get another one. So he's driving this thing down the road, and he comes in there and he goes, I've got no reverse. It's got a stick in it. It's a manual transmission. So they give it to me. So I pull it up. I try to back up. It doesn't do anything. You put it in reverse. You can feel it going in reverse, but nothing's happening. You're sitting there. Uh, engine revs up. There's nothing going. But it works fine in every other gear. So I get it up. That happens reverses in the very back of it. I pull the drive shaft out. I get the extension housing off of it. And all of the little toofies where the synchronizer slides over reverse, you know, fifth and reverse are in the back, uh, have been round off. What he did was he went first, second, third, fourth, fifth, talking on the phone or whatever. I don't know. We didn't have no cell phones back then. He wasn't thinking. He brought it back into reverse going down the road. <laughs> Managed to get it in reverse going down the road. He shared every damn one of the little teeth. Well, it's easy to fix. I just got a reverse gear put on there, put it all back together, and he had a reverse and everything was fine. Wasn't that hard to fix, but it sounds like a major disaster. You know, and it could have been, but the weak link was the little teeth around the gear. All right, now then. Let me see if I can get this thing to change again. Uh-oh, that's all right. As explained in the gear section, all forward driving gears are helical gears. That makes them quiet, gives them additional strength, uh, but they're angled. They can't be slid in and out of engagement with one another. Okay, that's a little model that you got set up. I think it's hanging on that uh, press, I think, with a wire. Is that, that, that bottle hanging on that press with a wire? No. Well, you're supposed to keep up with it. That is your job to keep up with that. Okay. For this reason, the speed gears are not directly spined to the shaft on which they ride. Their inner diameter is smooth, lets them rotate freely on the shaft. Okay. When the gear needs to be connected to the shaft, the synchronizer sleeve moves over and engages the clutching teeth. This one's engaged to the shaft, the other one's not. So this one goes and it engages that and the gear that you need to be in. And that's the synchronizer sleeve, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. This locks the synchronizer sleeve to the speed gear, which the speed gear is not shown here. The speed gear is on the other side of this. And this has sort of got a little cone shape to it. And shape, it's got some little grooves cut in it so that it's riding on a sort of a cone shape of the gear. And it cuts through that um, ball and it forces the other gear to match the speed of the synchronizer. And that's why, have you ever downshifted and heard one go, you ever heard that racket when you downshift in a manual transmission? That's what you're hearing is those synchronizers calling it to change speed. This right here is kind of what it looks like. Synchronizers and feed gear. All right, this is your little blocker ring I was talking about. See that little, uh, this gear right here, they got a different color so you can tell the difference between the parts. There's a, this sleeve slides on that. It, sl it pushes this up against there. That little cone goes against this cone, of the inverted cone, and it actually matches the speed of that gear to this. Now these gears are both the same size, right? That might be a little bigger. And so I was thinking that might not look quite right. So you got your speed gear, synchronizer sleeve moves. Synchronizers to make the speed of the gear max out of the shaft. I've been talking about that, right? All right. That ought to be done since the rotating speed of the gear is different from the speed of the shaft. If the speed of the gear and the shaft weren't the same before the synchronizer sleeve engaged the gear's clutching teeth, 
both the sleeve and the clenching, you're going to be damaged. Now, if you have one that's starting to grind in there, you're going to find out that the teeth are going off of that little brass blocker ring, and usually it's brass, it can't be other stuff. That's what it looks like. That's my finger holding one right there. See that little cone-shaped shoulder? And see the inside teeth on there. It's got cone-shaped inner surface, and it's got a cone-shaped inner surface pushed into contact with that ship, with that ear. And you have, this is what they look like. Your little teeth will get knocked off, and then whenever that synchronizer tries to throw it over, it'll start grinding on those teeth until it eventually knocks them off. And this is a verbiage that explains what I've just been talking about. Okay, so that right there, that's the blocking ring. You gotta have this synchronizer sleeve there in order to make that all work. This goes against your blocking ring. Some people call these synchronizers. This is actually the synchronizer sleeve. And this right here is a little detent that causes it to sort of click up and you know want to stay in the gear you put it in. And this is the one that's, see the teeth on the inside of that one? That's hooked over to the shaft. And the gear that this is going to engage spins freely on the shaft, and the only connection it has is with that. Uh, these compressed inserts move and knocks to the inner diameter of the sleeve. So there's a place that matches this little bump, and this is spring-loaded on the inside, so when it slides up there, it kind of stays in place. It's shifted by means of shift forks that fit into the groove, cut in the center of the synchronizer sleeve. And Eddie had a transmission that one of his guys had that when you move the gear shifter, it wouldn't move the synchronizer sleeve. And what had happened is it had worn the little inside uh, not, uh, pegs off of the fork so that it was just, it was moving outside of the synchronizer sleeve, but it wouldn't work. And it was so beautiful, it looked like it had been machined off. You know what, what had caused that? That guy had a tendency to drive down the road with his hand on the gear shifter. And over time, it continued to eat away a little bit of that until it wasn't anything there to hold anymore. So they had to replace that shift fork. I mean, that wasn't a big deal, but the guy couldn't put it in that gear. So the, if a transmission actually winds up in two gears, it's locked up and won't go anywhere. And sometimes the shifter will get, the transmission will be in neutral. I mean, excuse me, the, the shifter will be in neutral, but the transmission will be in gear. And that way you're always in the same gear. And that has to be fixed mechanically, too. That happens when people are speed shifting and stuff, you know, jerking stuff around. Y'all never do that, do you? Do y'all have manual transmissions in your cars or... Oh, the one in mine, it's, it's well, it's not a Mac 2, we've got a shifter on it, and then the one in my dad's is the Liberty Cross Yeah. And the harder you snatch them, the better, yep. better it is. Yeah. And the ones that, uh, have you ever seen inside of one of those cars that goes through the eighth mile, or the quarter mile cars, or ag cars, you know, with the, the professional ones? Spotter shifter. They have got a bunch of different shifters. This is what it looks like. Those the, the, the link up transition. Yeah, they go four or five. Yeah, they, they pull this lever, they pull that lever, they pull that lever, then they hit their parachute. <laughs> and that's we have that one in uh, one of Well, see, it seems like this is a lot of fun, but you're getting in the thing and you're all built it in, you go oh, 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 poof, and you're done. You know, and a top fuel dragster burns 20 gallons of fuel in 900 revolutions. You know that? Know, uh, that Liberty is a five-speed transmission. Yeah. And you're like this, but it's just in a row right now. Yeah. yeah, crazy stuff. That's the end of the slideshow. Did anybody go to sleep? Uh -huh. That's good. You guys have been really, uh, really good. Anybody got any questions or anything you want to ask about that? Does anybody feel like you've been railroaded? Yeah. Whenever you get into this thing, whenever you get into the, uh, the material that you're going to be doing on the computer, it'll fill in the blanks. And this stuff I'm telling you will fall in place. Because you've basically, you know, I could spend a long time in here talking, but I don't think you'd like that. Would you? No. No, you wouldn't. So you can study at your own pace whenever you've got plenty of time to concentrate and you're looking at the animations on that screen, you'd be surprised at how all of this stuff will begin to come clear and you'll understand it a whole lot better. That's what we're doing this for. I just wanted to go through this pretty quick. I try uh, to get these things done in less than 30 minutes because that way, uh, my, my father-in-law used to say, your mind can only comprehend what your behind can endure. So if you're sitting there too long, you know, people, you start losing people if you talk more than 25 minutes. Me, I start losing after about five minutes. Anybody got any questions?